Hello, my name is John Hawley. I'm an open source developer at VMware, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Ansible. I'm trying to do a, a tutorial over the internet um, and to kind of give uh, you an overview of what Ansible is, what it does, how it can help you uh, build out better infrastructure um, and more consistent infrastructure. So um, if for whatever reason you want to reach out to me, um, uh, my email, uh, jholly at, uh, at vmware.com or warthog9 at eaglescrag.net. Um, both work. Go ahead and uh, drop me an email. Um, IRC, Warthog9, um, I'm on a bunch of the, the different networks, Freenode being the obvious one. Um, Twitter, at Warty9, and GitHub, uh, Warthog9. Um, if for any reason you can't <laughs> seem to, to track me down, um, there, there are a number of people who who know who I am and who should be able to help point you in the right direction. But feel free to reach out to me um, either uh, um, through any of these means. So um, let's talk about Ansible. Ansible is one of uh, the many configuration and management systems that are out there. Um, Ansible being very specifically targeted at um, large scale infrastructure. So there's a lot of different players in this space. Um, if you're familiar with you know, Chef or Puppet, or uh, um, any of these uh, uh, kinds of pieces, they exist specifically to um, help you manage uh, uh, your infrastructure. So, if we if we kind of take a step back and we go back to the you know the the bad old days, you know, back into the 1990s, um, or even potentially before that, um, the number of machines that a, a sysadmin or that an, uh, um, a a company would have could basically be counted on you know one or two hands maybe one or two, you know, the number of racks that they have filled with machines could be counted on one or two hands. This isn't a lot of machines for, uh, for a variety of reasons. They were very expensive, um, and it, it was much easier for somebody to be able to just directly log in, make the changes that they needed to make, and then uh, uh, move on with life. Well, unsurprisingly, fast forwarding to today, the world is a very different place. We no longer uh, uh, measure machines in terms of even numbers. If you look at the, the, the large uh, um, uh, uh, data centers that are out there, they're not measured in number of servers or you know number of CPUs or whatnot. They're measured in megawatts of power used. So we, we have gone so far beyond the scale of an, a single individual being able to trivially manage um, the number of machines that they have to, to being into the tens or even hundreds of thousands of machines category, where consistency and uh, um, re reproducibility becomes much, much stronger uh, a need than it used to be. So things like Chefs, things like Puppet, things like Ansible have all come about to try and solve this problem. Ansible specifically uh, um, comes at this problem in a very different way than a lot of the other options that are out there, which I personally think actually makes it a lot more powerful uh, a tool. Uh, um, and uh, uh, the biggest reason for that is that um, it uses SSH directly as its mechanism of communicating with all, all of the servers, as well as being able to talk to other APIs more directly. So, what does this actually mean? In, in the case of a lot of other options that are out there, the way they communicate is that you actually bring up a service daemon on the machine you want to configure, the, the machine that you want to control, and that stays resident and that stays persistent for the entire lifespan of that machine that you want, uh, um, assuming you want to control it. This has an advantage that it is a dedicated uh, channel for doing this communication, for doing this command and control. However, it also means that now you have an additional process that's running, you have an additional authentication mechanism that you have to worry about. There's a number of different pieces here that add to the complexity without necessarily actually making it better. Um, now, that being said, Ansible uh, um, actually uses just SSH. So all of the Linux boxes that we can basically think of all uh, um, run SSH. Even, you know, Windows machines or, or, you know, small IoT devices all run SSH. Um, and, and this makes it a really common, really easy way uh, um, to at least start the process of getting into the device so that you can actually start interacting with it. And so what Ansible does is instead of, you know, having this piece there, it just SSHs in and then uh, uh, passes over the pieces that it needs to run and then actually runs them. 
this is really, really awesome. It makes use of a lot of the, the system tools that are already there. And on top of that, the authentication mechanism is uh, uh, very well understood because we already, you know, if you're running SSH, you already have to deal with how do you authenticate SSH? Well, now, it, now you just have an additional user that can make use of that machine. Uh, um, and while, you know, SSH works really, really great um, for, you know, your, your servers and whatnot. Well, what about your switches? Well, again, a lot of the switches out there, particularly the high-end ones, you know, things from Cisco or Arista or Dell, um, they all actually run SSH as well. So you can actually SSH in and issue commands directly into an SSH uh, uh, session there. So this actually still gives you a mechanism for not only controlling your servers, but your switch infrastructure you know, your, your NAS infrastructure, a lot of other things start becoming available that you can use. Now, well, what do you do when you run into situations where you can't SSH into something? Let's take, you know, oh, I don't know, VMware. Um, from the, the ESX or the vSphere perspective, they, uh, um, those particular systems, they don't want you SSHing into them. They actually have a rich API for being able to control them, either through uh, a REST API or there's a, a, um, an older SOAP API. Um, that can actually go and control uh, uh, most aspects of uh, um, your entire vCenter v -center or ESX experience. Now, in the normal case, uh, um, Ansible uh, will SSH out and run commands, either uh, 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 on whatever you're doing. Well, you can also run things against a local host. So if you actually have all of the pieces that you need to be able to communicate with uh, uh, something like VMware, uh, um, through a, 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 an additional channel, you can actually just run those effectively against the local host that would then connect back out to the remote um, endpoint and be able to configure it. So, th th this is why Ansible gets very, very interesting. When you look at some of the other options, they have a tendency to not really be able to, you know, and I'm going to pick on switches because this is a really uh, easy, low-hanging fruit uh, to pick on, but they, uh, uh, it, it's much harder to be able to configure or uh, 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 deal with those if you need some sort of a resident process on them. The fact that you can just SSH out to them, even just normally like a, a normal you know, admin would, um, and issue commands means that you can actually script all of this into uh, uh, an Ansible playbook. And the other really nice thing about how Ansible works is that it works kind of the way uh, um, a sysadmin would approach uh, uh, scripting this up themselves. So if you look at uh, some of the other options, they try to make this a, a very uh, um, prescriptive or, or very, uh, um, the, the, you give the, the program the end goal that you want and you just blindly accept that it will be able to figure out how to get there. Now, this has some advantages because it means that you don't have to think too hard about how you get there. But that's not the way a lot of us think. That's not the, the way um, a lot of these things actually get set up. So the way Ansible actually works is it's declar declarative in nature. So it, you, you do one thing, then you do another, then you do another, then you do another. And really what this is, is it's basically like a shell script that's running on the remote machine, although you don't actually write this in shell, you write it in YAML. Um, and this, this gets passed off to the, machine, uh, the remote machine to actually run. And so, you know, things kind of happen in a specific order. Checks can be done. You know, comparisons and verification can also be done. So there's a lot of really nice pieces that can happen there. So this is uh, uh, the, 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 what Ansible is. Now, Ansible is not bare metal provisioning. Uh, um, the really big reason for this is that bare metal provisioning is actually really, really hard because uh, there's no good way, there's no common API, there's no simple way to, to bring up a machine and just start spewing uh, uh, stuff at it to you know, set up hard drives and do all these kinds of things. There's some other products that try to do this. Um, they're, they're much more complicated, they're much more bizarre, and that you actually have to really control the entire stack to be able to use them, you know, be able to netboot, run your own DHCP, run your own, you know, DNS, and, and you know, a number of other pieces there. So this can, this mostly cannot deal with bare metal. There is some movement to, to be able to use some IPMI and some other pieces there. It doesn't really quite work out the way you expect. 
So more or less, you're still going to need somebody to go in and get a basic operating system on there. A really minimal install doesn't take that long. It's really easy to be prescriptive. And it, 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 and it just you just need to get it up to the point where it has network, and you can uh, um, log into it with SSH. After that, everything else can be be handled uh, uh, from Ansible. It's also technically not configuration management. Exactly, sort of. So, really, what this is is that, uh, uh, Ansible is a, a, a piece of orchestration, a, a piece of. Um, infrastructure to go and rebuild uh, um, uh, servers or services and whatnot. It is not necessarily configuration management. However, because in the course of trying to set things up, you do need to copy configuration uh, um, configurations out to machines, set up, make sure things are, are, are in place, it basically acts as configuration management if you kind of think about it in a, a, in a slightly askew way. If you're going to use this for configuration management, you are almost certainly going to need to make sure that you actually keep track of what those configurations all do. Something like, hmm, source control, which Ansible is also not source control. Um, so if you're going to do this, use something like Git, SVN, Perforce. It, doesn't, it almost doesn't matter what uh, um, version control system you use. But if you're going to do configuration management, you almost certainly need to keep something like Git around just so that you can keep track of what's going on. And when things fail, you can roll them back. Now, there is some caveats with, with configuration management and source configuration going on here. Ansible is not a or Ansible by itself is not centralized. Anybody who has access to that machine with the appropriate per permissions can run Ansible against it. So if you have a, 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 a large uh, a system, you could run um, the entire configuration uh, um, and deployment from a laptop, and then the next day run it from a different server or somewhere else. There's no specific central point here that necessarily is the source of truth. Another reason why that, that you may or may not want to, to use this for configuration management or source control. Keep it. Keep that in mind. Again, centralized. It's not centralized uh, unless you really, really want it to be. This would require basically keeping all of the authentication tokens in a central location instead of necessarily keeping them in a more distributed fashion. There's pros and cons to both sides of this. Um, that is uh, outside of the, the, the scope of this discussion, but it's something to be aware of. Um, it's not capable of making eggs and bacon, at least not with external hardware. and. It's YAML processing is not kind. If anybody has actually dealt with YAML before, and in fact, in, in some of the examples I, I give further on, um, the, YAML, I, the, 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 the YAML does actually screw up. It's kind of a mess. It, it, it's, in some respects, it, it's white space matters to an even further extent than you would expect even in Python. So unfortunately, this is the, the configuration tool it's both powerful, but it's also slightly obnoxious. And if you're going to be looking at the slides later on um, for things, there's going to be YAML examples in there. You, the, almost certainly you will not be able to tell the correct indentation. There's not much I can do about it uh, um, just because of the way uh, um, variable uh, uh, width fonts work. <sighs> Sorry, um, but please, if you take a look at the, the slides after the fact or you just uh, uh, open them up, they should be available if they're not. Yell at me on Twitter or something, and I'll, I'll make sure to, to get those up somewhere where you should be able to find them. There's also um, a couple of uh, virtual machines that are intended to go with this. Um, they're based on CentOS 7, at least at the time of this recording, um, so that you can actually follow along and do exactly what um, the, uh, the examples that I give later or all, uh, all of or any of the code in here. Um, they were actually basically generated from... Uh, um, their own uh, Ansible files themselves, so that they're actually reproducible in, in a useful way. They have been updated at least up to the, the point where um, the, this video was shot, and those should be available. They won't necessarily be uh, immediately available uh, along with this recording, but they, uh, um, I will make sure that there is some sort of a note somewhere on where you should be able to get your hands on those. So. Um, they're about two gigs in size uh, uh, when you need to go grab them, and I'll talk about the, the rest of that later. But, moving on. And, of course, you can't really talk about Ansible without also talking about Ansible Tower because it's going to come up. 
So Ansible Tower is basically uh, um, Ansible itself is completely open source. You can you know use it uh, um, in for your own infrastructure or anything you want. But the uh, um, but it's not uh, uh, it doesn't have a GUI and it doesn't have a, a number of other pieces that are sometimes really really useful. Those are all encapsulated into Red Hat's uh, commercial offering, which is Ansible Tower. It's basically Ansible, everything you know and love about Ansible, except that it also has a GUI. It does centralize everything, but it centralizes that so that you have job scheduling, access control, and a few other nice pieces. It's also where the commercial support for Ansible has a tendency to go. Again, I work for VMware, not uh, um, not uh, uh, Ansible or Red Hat, so um, if you really want to talk about Ansible Tower, go talk to them. I'm, not going to spend too much more time about that from here. So, um, this is where things get a little exciting. Um, so, let's talk about the VMs that we're going to work on. I, I, I've already just kind of mentioned them. Um, there's two of them. There's a client and there's a target. The client is arguably misnamed, but that is the machine that we're going to be working from. So this is the machine that you know uh, uh, we would be typing things into, so that we can communicate with the, the the target machine, which is where we're going to be configuring that that machine specifically. Um, I've already pre-canned the SSH keys, so if anybody ever finds these SSH keys, please consider these absolutely burned, because the, the, uh, they're basically publicly available on the internet with no password on their key in the whole nine yards. Um, obviously, the, uh, I said, like I said before, the, the, the virtual machines are CentOS 7, and everything should be installed for these to work. So all of the, the examples that I'm going to give here um, were run explicit, uh, uh, um, exclusively on the virtual machines just to make sure they all worked, and that's how, how they were done. Um, they, they will boot up, and, and unfortunately my, my video here is, is obscuring it a little bit, but this will come up a little bit later in um, a video. Uh, um, but when, once they boot up, they should um, show you what the, uh, the username and the password are, as well as any IPv4 or IPv6 interface uh, um, address that is associated with that VM. This is so that um, you can actually figure out what's going on on that machine, you know where where its virtual a uh, virtual uh, machine address is and those kinds of things. So um, I would also like to point out that these were created and mostly tested with uh, um, VMware Workstation. They have been shown to work with both AW uh, directly in AWS and um, with VirtualBox. I haven't really tested them anywhere else, so your mileage may vary. But they're relatively straightforward. They're not super complicated. There's not a lot really weird going on there other than I've pre-installed a few things or I have a, a couple of extra specific files for the purposes of showing um, folks everything. So, it, it, you know, if you can't get this to work on whatever your, your favorite virtual machine platform is, give me a ping. I may be able to help you. I'm trying to make the, these as easy to use as possible. So, um, and uh, obviously, like I said, these work on uh, uh, these were tested on VMware Workstation. They should work fine on Fusion. Um, obviously, ESX would work if you have it. That's although that seems kind of like overkill. Um, VirtualBox and AWS have been confirmed to work. Um, everything else, you're kind of on your own. So, let's talk about some something really, really basic. Um, when you start uh, when you start using Ansible, you need to tell Ansible where the machines that you want to to interact with are. The, this typically gets put into Etsy Ansible hosts. There are uh, um, ways of passing in this hosts file um, from a more uh, from a more localized directory. So if you wanted to keep everything in Git directly, that's possible. Um, it just means that you have to pass uh, uh, some slightly different configuration options or, or switches into Ansible when you run it. Um, but the typical location is in the Etsy Ansible host. Um, I've already dealt with the SSH keys that we're going to deal with for the virtual machine. And the simplest thing we can do is, as it's written here, Ansible all, so all of the machines that Ansible knows to talk to, uh, um, run the module ping. This literally just uh, um, verifies that it can access and talk to the remote system. And if you run that, this is what you should get. Now, you know, I show you the output, but let's actually take a look at what this actually looks like. 
So this is the virtual machine booting up. Um, takes a little bit. It is an actual virtual machine. Um, I, I didn't want to uh, uh, delude the experience and I wanted everybody to kind of see what this looks like during its boot up process. It realistically just looks like every Linux box that ever boots in the universe. Um, so if you, you've never had to, to boot a Linux box, this is probably a new experience. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, so it boots up. And in the off chance that it boots up, and it shows you the login screen, but it doesn't actually show you the um, IP information. Login, uh, um, which in, in this case is root and uh, uh, tutorial underscore base, and then just exit. And that should refresh correctly. It's usually a, a, a problem of the IP, or the, the interface hasn't quite gotten a DHCP response in time. So that is what it, it ultimately should look like uh, um, once this is actually done. So again, the username and the, uh, 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 the password for the machine are written right there. And the IP addresses should also be there. If you want, go ahead and log in. Obviously, I can't type the, um, uh, uh, the password. And you should be, uh, uh, um, uh, if for any other reason you need to look up what the IP address is without just exiting IP space adder, great way to get, get back at that. So, now that we've actually proven that we can uh, um, talk to the, 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 the local machine, because all we've done uh, um, from ping so far is the only thing in Etsy uh, 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 hosts uh, um, should have been this one machine. Now, you are going to have to actually boot up both machines or both VMs to get both IP addresses. Um, and the, what you're going to put into Etsy Ansible host is actually exactly the uh, um, the 192.168 in the video example, it's 21.129. And on the, the, the slides here, it's uh, 192.168.2.131. Um, that's, that's all you need to put in there. Uh, um, there should be an entry in there, probably the, the 2.131 entry. You can just delete the, uh, that and fill in the rest of the IP address that you need there. So let's have Ansible actually do something because you know pinging everything making sure that it can actually do stuff isn't all that exciting in, um, in some respects but let's actually have it run something on the remote machine so if we run ansible all again and you know on all of the ansible nodes it knows how to talk to um, minus a and then give it a command it will run that on all of the machines uh, um, uh, that Ansible knows how to talk to. So obviously we've already gotten to the point where we, we've got the machine up, it's running, and if we just type in Ansible all, well, apparently make sure that the, uh, the host file is uh, uh, correctly up to date, which this one obviously is not. And secretly here, I am uh, uh, updating the uh, 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 the IP ad or I'm looking up the IP address from the other machine. And then if we do an Ansible all uh, um, uh, minus m ping, this is what you should get. or in the, uh, in the specific case of this, Ansible all minus M ping, obviously you get, uh, um, uh, uh, it attempts to SSH out. Obviously in this case, I haven't updated the, the known hosts, so accepting the fingerprint. If anybody's curious, that fingerprint should be the same across all of them, and this is what you get when ping actually completes correctly. So, um, Ansible has actually done something at this point. Now, let's have it go and do something a little bit different. Let's actually write 
a playbook. Now, playbooks are typically what uh, uh, Ansible runs. It is a collection or a set of tasks for Ansible to go and run. Sometimes these include much more complicated roles. Um, in the simplest example I can give you, it's literally Hello World, because everybody likes to run Hello World when you write things. Um, and uh, uh, it's a YAML file, so basically on, on your, uh, um, uh, on the client, you create a directory called Playbooks, um, you create a, a, a file called hello world.yaml. You write in uh, what you want it to do, which is almost exactly what we just uh, uh, did with uh, uh, ping. And then we go ahead and run it. So let's see what that looks like. So in this specific instance, uh, um, we're only going to hello world against the local machine. Um, this is to show that you can actually run things uh, um, against the machine you're actually running Ansible from, not necessarily, all, uh, but not necessarily having to go all the way out and talk directly to uh, um, a machine. And I'm going to note one thing that's really nice uh, in Ansible. If you add a name to something, that name is what is displayed. Um, when Ansible goes to run things. So it's mostly just a nice way of, of defining what the task that it's going to do is. So you'll see that uh, um, uh, there's a top level name for the hello world for the, the entire playbook. Um, and then the task itself has a name of hello world. Um, they're freeform text, you can kind of put anything you want in there. And obviously we're using the, the shell command to just echo hi. So once you've got that all written in, and saved. If you do Ansible playbook and then the name of the playbook, it will just run. This obviously connected to the local machine. It's actually going to build up a bunch of facts about the local machine, which we don't necessarily need for this, but in a lot of instances you do want it. And then it's just going to echo uh, um, hi. Now, the interesting thing here is that we didn't actually have any output that we could visibly see because the, the output stream that's going on the, the remote machine, i.e. localhost in this case, isn't actually visible to us. Okay, that's fair. Now, let's take a look at what this looks like if we go ahead and do this remotely. And obviously the, the output, if anybody else is curious what this should look like uh, um, without actually just watching the, the video that was embedded here. So, um, now, if we want to go and do this remotely, the only thing we realistically need to change is the hosts line there. Now, I'm also going to go down a, a little bit further here, and we're going to add a copy. So the copy module is basically how you get, uh, um, you, you copy files either that are locally or you end up creating files on the remote machine. So we, uh, um, if you look at this, we basically pick the remote machine, um, we echo hi, doesn't really, we don't really see anything other than it should complete, assuming that Echo does exist. And then we copy a f um, into a file, hello world. Now, we specifically define what that content is instead of giving it a local file to copy over. It's kind of like if you were to, to echo um, some content directly into uh, and pipe it into a file. This is basically the same thing. So, and the destination file on the remote side that we want to use is uh, slash temp slash test file dot text. So, um, if I've got this correct, um, more or less we do the same thing. Um, I'm just going to modify the existing uh, um, hello world. Um, change the hosts. In my example, it's 192.168.21.1.1.1. I'm having to look this up because I didn't uh, scribble this down beforehand. And then I go ahead and add an additional task for copy. And if you're paying eagle-eyed attention to how this looks in the terminal window, um, copy and, uh, um, and the name of the task above it, those are both indented identically. In, a sec uh, um, in this specific case, I'm also putting content and test on the, uh, 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 on, at the same indentation level. And this is going to come back to bite me in a second. Because content and dest are not the same. Uh, uh, th those are uh, um, arguments to copy, not arguments in and of themselves. So the way this ends up getting processed 
actually uh, um, is wrong. And unsurprisingly, Ansible actually gives me an error. Um, so, mea culpa, um, if you're, you're trying to read this off of the slides directly, this is what, what I, I specifically meant. I actually did end up reading this directly off the, the slides. And I missed that extra indentation, even though I do this often enough that I should have known better. So I add some extra indentation. The amount of indentation doesn't actually matter, but the consistency of that indentation does. So fix that indentation issue for content dest, and then rerun it. Obviously, it's going to SSH out to the remote host again. Um, it's going to gather those facts. It's going to run uh, uh, the echo high, and then it's actually going to create slash temp slash test file dot text. Just to confirm that this did what I, I was expecting, I'm going to SSH out to that machine uh, um, as the root user, and I'm going to cat that file. And as you can see uh, um, in the video there, hello world does, uh, um, is in that file on the remote machine. So yay, we have now actually configured a remote machine and, uh, um, uh, and done something to it. Yay. <laughs> So, um, and again, if you uh, um, didn't or didn't watch the video or something, this is the expect roughly the expected output of what uh, um, the that playbook should run. So, and um, obviously, I've gone ahead and already uh, uh, shown that what is in the test file on the remote machine is what I'm expecting it to be, which is hello world. So, now that we've kind of talked about copying files, let's actually copy an actual file instead of just creating content into that file. In this particular case, um, we're just going to use the copy mechanism. I've already basically discussed it, except that what we're using for source is actually a little bit different. So in this specific case, I've already downloaded 20,000 leads under the sea um, into the virtual machine. Um, and we're just going to, uh, to copy that copy of uh, um, 20,000 leads under the sea into the remote machine. Uh, so nothing too exciting there. Um, again, I, I'm just going to end up um, creating uh, um, this file, but I wanted to prove to you that 20,000 leagues under the sea already exists on the virtual machine. It was there. It's got a few kilobytes uh, uh, of data uh, associated to it. And then I'm literally, you know, just copying and er, rewriting the uh, the entire YAML file here um, as I have to go look up the IP address yet again. Um, th this is kind of the, the, the really wonderful thing for groups or host names. When you start dealing with systems, uh, um, it makes it so much easier. But uh, for this example, just having the, the actual um, uh, IP address is what we're going to do because I don't want it, everyone to have to figure out how to do DNS and all this other kind of stuff just to test this. So, and then uh, um, we copy in the source, we copy in the destination. Obviously, uh, SRC and DEST are um, uh, uh, basically arguments that are being passed into the copy command. Once we've got those all in there, save it. And we're going to go ahead and run that as a playbook. So uh, again, the, the process that this is going to undergo, it's going to go, it's going to uh, uh, get a bunch of facts about the remote host. This is what it does by default at the beginning of every any time it runs. There are ways to turn this off. There are reasons why you may want to do this. Um, and then uh, um, after it's gotten the facts and it's gotten kind of all set up so that it, it can run the next command, which is literally just copy 20,000 leagues under the sea to the remote machine under slash temp. And um, at this point, as you, you can see in the video, it should have uh, uh, completed. And then at this point, um, I'm going to SHA-256 sum the local copy, which gives you a, a, a nice giant uh, uh, checksum. And then on the remote machine, I'm going to actually run Ansible on all of the remote machines and run the exact same SHA-256 except against the, the path I'm expecting it to be. And this will run. And we'll get a response back on this one. So uh, um, depending on what's going on and how you're running things, you do actually get information back. And as you can see from the video, um, we did end up 
um, having the same uh, hash. So the file was copied over. And for anybody who, who uh, didn't watch the video, this is what the, uh, uh, roughly uh, uh, was seen. Okay, copying files is all well and good, but let's kind of move on to something a bit more interesting. Package management. Everybody loves package management. We all need packages. We're, you know, the, the, generally the idea with a, um, an Ansible box um, that you're going to admin is what you're going to do is you're going to do the most basic minimal install you can, just enough to get you up to SSH and have a network configuration. Once you've gotten there, you can process everything else. But usually what this means is that you're missing anything else useful that you would want. So in this particular example, um, we're going to make sure that Core Utils is installed. We're then also going to make sure that Ansible um, is absent on the remote machine. So we want to make sure that Ansible isn't present on the target because we don't actually need Ansible present on the target. When Ansible wants to do something, it actually bundles it all up and copies the entire thing that it wants to execute out to the remote host for execution, including the, um, the predominance of its, uh, the libraries it needs to run it. This is really, really awesome because your remote machine doesn't necessarily need to know anything about Ansible to be able to take advantage of it. Again, the same reason that things like uh, um, switches and whatnot can take advantage of this when you usually can't install random packages for the most part. Um, and then we're going to install Kause because if you've never played with Kause, it's a fun, stupid little uh, utility that's uh, uh, worth playing with. So, let's go ahead and do that. So, new playbook, quickly fill in um, all of the intermediate pieces. This, this kind of ends up becoming... Uh, um, uh, 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 second hat for most people, and in fact, you're gonna, you'll notice uh, um, from the slides I actually used the yum module, um, which has technically been deprecated for the DNF module, although it's just a uh, um, basically a search and replace for yum for DNF. But I'm, um, but in the video, you're going to notice that I'm actually using package. So package is a slightly more uh, um, uh, um, a higher level version of YUM or DNF. And packet, what package can do is it actually takes a look at the system that you're running on and uses the native package management system instead of just assuming that you're on a Red Hat type system um, or CentOS or Fedora and using RPM or YUM and it actually gives you the option of using uh, um, apt or apt-get or um, I believe even emerge and a few other things are, are supported. Um, but this basically makes it a, a more generic way uh, uh, of doing uh, um, package management. The um, for the most part, like the state command and whatnot are all the same across things like YAML or package. Um, but package, unsurprisingly, because it is, uh, uh, it can be used across a much more or many more op or distros. It is slightly more limited in what it can do. So if there 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 can definitely be situations where you may need to actually fall all the way back to you know a, a, a distro specific situation. Um, if you're particularly if you're writing ro uh, common roles across you know different distros, Debian or Ubuntu, um, Red Hat, CentOS, Fedora, um, and uh, uh, but if you're just doing basic things, package should work. And once we've written the uh, um, the playbook itself, we run the playbook, and then this is going to chug for a little bit. Um, in this specific case, again, it's going to fetch all of the the um, the information about the remote system, and more or less what this is doing is it's just filling in a, a, a large variable set about what's going on on the remote machine. So, you know, what kernel it's running, um, what version of the operating system it's running, whether it's Debian or Fedora or CentOS or whatnot, and just basic information like that that you would then be able to reference in your own uh, rules or playbooks. And then, um, again, once that's done, it's going to run through and it's going to make sure that Core Utils is present. So if um, it went through and it figured out all of the packages that are available um, during that first step, it's going to know that Core Utils is already present and it's not going to need to do anything. Um, it's also going to notice that Ansible is already absent because it's not installed in the remote machine. And then it's actually going to install Kause, which was not actually installed uh, uh, on the machine. 
Uh, well, I believe it wasn't installed because it took a little bit longer than I was expecting. And then if you run Kause and Moo against the remote machine, congratulations, you get a cow that says Moo. So, uh, and uh, um, for anyone else who's interested, this is what the output of the playbook itself runs. Um, but uh, uh, um, before we kind of wrap this up, I want to give run into a, a couple of uh, um, additional things that Ansible can do. Because right now, if you've followed everything in this, particularly if you've used the virtual machines, you've actually gotten to the point where you have done the most basic Hello World tutorial for Ansible, and this should give you a jumping point to actually being able to go out and do additional things. But I want to give you an idea of some of the additional pieces that you can do. So, um, what you've got here on the top um, is a... Uh, 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 an example of groups. So in Etsy uh, uh, Ansible hosts, you can actually define groups of hosts. In this case, um, pi3 hosts. And a, uh, um, a host itself can actually be a member of multiple groups. So instead of, uh, you know, when, it, uh, uh, when an Ansible playbook asks for what host to, to run against, you can actually give it a group. So in my case, this would be a pi3 hosts group. Um, and as you can see, I even specifically say that the Ansible port to communicate on is 456 i.e. in this situation, I've changed what the SSH port is on my remote system. Uh, Ansible should talk to port uh, 456 on the remote system and just predefines all of that. But I can also uh, um, define for all of those hosts a variable. And in this specific instance, I can redefine what the Python interpreter is to Python 3. So uh, um, for anybody who, who's um, having to interact with more recent systems, Python 2 is dead. Well, uh, uh, um, yay, uh, and Python 3 is now the de facto standard for Python. Except that on a lot of systems uh, you're still going to run into right now, Python 2 and Python 3 are installed. And there are situations where uh, uh, you, uh, you may want to explicitly define that you wish to interact with Python 3. Ansible is um, at this point all Python 3, so if, it, if you can use Python 3 on the remote system, that's probably the way you want to go. Uh, um, and this basically instead of just using slash user bin python this explicitly tells ansible that it should go ahead and use user bin python 3 um, to run python commands on the remote system also want to call out conditionals so th there's ways of creating variables inside a, a, of ansible and you can um use those variables to define um a, a additional behavior so things like um, in this particular example, uh, uh, copied uh, uh, out of my own role, role, uh, role set, um, I wanted to make sure that NTP w uh, uh, D was installed. Uh, um, but uh, um, I wanted to also make sure that when uh, that it only did this for Debian, because unsurprisingly, uh, um, different uh, uh, distros call certain things slightly differently. So if you want to take a look at uh, uh, Apache on uh, uh, Fedora, Red Hat, or CentOS. It's HTTPD. If you look at it from the Debian perspective, it's Apache 2. Well, at some point, you know, if you want to be able to run this module on multiple different systems, sometimes you just have to define, well, if this is Debian, this is what it is. If this is Fedora, this is what it is. And there are ways of taking entire, you know, default variable sets and whatnot uh, um, and making this a lot easier for yourself. But I want to point out that there are conditionals um, that can be used, and they can actually be really, really complicated and very interesting. Um, so uh, uh, that's worth looking at as well. And because it, uh, um, I would be a terrible uh, 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 person to uh, um, leave you without uh, um, uh, uh, giving you some places to go and find additional documentation, docs.ansible.com is really awesome. It covers a huge amount of really useful things in the entire Ansible ecosystem. Um, and the, the, the documentation has a tendency to be very, very good. Um, so yay, the, this is, it's not very often I, I legitimately get to, to compliment a, a project on their documentation, but Ansible does actually um, get a, a solid kudo here. Um, and when you go to try and start doing things, when you wanna start doing more complicated things, let's say you wanna set up NTP uh, um, uh, for whatever reason, or you wanna uh, play with crony, 
um, there's actually pre-built roles that have, have baked, uh, uh, that people have baked together to do really complicated, very powerful things already for you. So you don't necessarily have to reinvent all of these wheels. And sometimes these can be um, incredibly useful, particularly for being uh, for standardizing things across your entire infrastructure. Um, and you wanted to go and take a look for those in Galaxy. It's like package management uh, um, to a certain extent uh, uh, for Ansible roles, um, but beware, you know, basically anybody can upload things. So this is a bit more of a free-for-all a la NPM versus, you know, something like a, a, a distro-level package management system. So keep that in mind. Um, and obviously places like Ansible on Freenode uh, um, are great ways to go and ask questions sometimes. And um, unfortunately, my, my large head is, uh, is covering up my own contact information. Um, again, my email, jholly at vmware.com um, or warthog9 at eagleskrag.net. Um, I'm on IRC Warthog9, uh, um, at the very least on Freenode. Um, if you uh, uh, want to try and track me down on Twitter, I'm at warty9. And on GitHub, I'm warthog9. Um, I would like to thank you for, trying to go, uh, uh, for taking the time to get through this. I hope it was useful. Um, obviously, uh, I look forward to doing this again uh, um, in, in person where I can actually help people more uh, uh, going forward. But hopefully the fact that this has been recorded, uh, uh, people will find this useful and uh, um, we can actually disper uh, we can uh, disperse this particular tutorial a bit further. So thank you very much. So, um, I'm glad you guys got to watch uh, uh, past me um, speak at the micro or speak at a, a, a webcam for uh, about about 50 minutes. Um, I know the questions have been coming in. I do want to highlight a couple of the ones that I've already answered that have already come in. Um, in particular, the first one, which I think most everybody has probably seen, um, where can you get the virtual machines that I was using in the demo? So there is a link to a Dropbox. Please, by all means, go get it. Um, there's a directory and a zip file. Uh, the zip file, you just, it's literally just the directory zipped up so that there's only one download blob. Um, so if you download that, be prepared. You're going to need a couple of extra gigs to, to uncompress it. Um, otherwise, just grab the directory. You should be fine. Um, there, let's see, what what other questions here? Um, yes, the presentation will be available for download on Sketch. Um, I will probably do that in the next 10, 20 minutes, because um, otherwise I'm going to forget, and um, I know that people are going to want to be able to go and look at the, those examples um, more directly. If anybody really wants them in a different format, ping me on Twitter or something, and maybe I'll start a GitHub or something like that and throw the, throw those all up there, in there. Um, let's see. Uh, there was a question um, from Eric Adams about, um, are there any Linux dis uh, distributions where Ansible is problematic or does it work about the same across all of the distributions? Um, for the most part, Ansible is going to work uh, basically the same across the distributions. It, it's really where the distributions have differences is where you're going to end up having to, to code around problems. Um, uh, uh, package management is kind of where you're going to see this a lot just because um, various distributions call packages slightly different things. They split certain packages up in slightly different ways, and you're probably going to end up having to to have a bunch of, you know, you know if Debian, if CentOS, if you know, something um, to make this all work. So, um, but otherwise, I mean, like you, you log into a, a Linux box, it's going to act more or less the same as any other Linux box. There's not a whole lot you have to do there. Um, there was a related question about asking about Raspberry Pis. The only thing you really need to pay attention to with Raspberry Pis and Ansible being slightly different is that the Raspberry Pi runs on ARM. Most of the systems that um, you're, you would necessarily interact with Ansible are all going to be x86 based. There's not really a whole lot of difference other than the fact you just can't copy a binary from one system to the other or back and forth. So that, that that's just something to keep in mind that, you know, just don't literally copy binaries around. Um, try and trust your package manager more or, you know, build in the appropriate checks. You know, if you're on an ARM CPU, you know, only copy ARM binaries kind of stuff. Um, let's see. Is Ansible... Uh, uh, declarative or procedural. 
Ansible of all of the these things has a tendency to be one of the the ones that's very hybrid between the the, the model. You, you if you think about like I said in the the, the actual presentation, if you think about um, the configuration files, the playbooks that you're passing to Ansible, they're, they're you know they're just literally you know do this, do this, do this, do this. Um, but what, when you build up these big recipes, these these big you know lists of rules. Um, you can actually turn these into to roles, and the roles can be a lot more complicated. Uh, can end up being a lot more complicated, and they can do a lot more pieces. But you, as the end user, all you do is say, "I want NTP," and then it wanders off magically, and NTP is set up. Um, or you know, it, like I've got uh, uh, an SSH module or SSH configuration module that I've got out on on my GitHub, um, where it goes and it properly sets up additional or different SSH ports, and it does a bunch of different pieces. But all I have to do from my my playbook perspective is I just say, include this, and I'm done. And then a bunch of magic happens, and I, I'm generally content. So, you know, it's it's one of the systems that has a, a much more hybrid approach to to how that all works. And I, again, a lot of the, these pre-baked pieces you can find out on Galaxy. Um, Galaxy is going to be a really good um, repository for these things, but keep in mind that Galaxy is literally the Wild West. Anybody can upload stuff. So it, it's um, the things that are up there are going to be a bit more like NPM or, or, or whatnot. Take them with a grain of salt. Look them over. Make sure they're doing what you think they're doing. Um, this is not to say that... Uh, um, Things are malicious out there, but when you've got anybody can upload stuff, and particularly when you're running a lot of these things potentially as root or with elevated permissions or in places that you don't want, <laughs> want bad things to happen, do your due diligence, double check things. I mean, it's you know uh, uh, most of most everything that's out on Galaxy has been uh, has been really awesome from what I've played with. Um, there was a question specific to the virtual machine, so obviously some people have gotten them downloaded and tried getting them up. Um, the Ethernet device, uh, again, like I said, I, I've tested this. I, I did most of my own testing on VMware. Um, if you're running VirtualBox, I do know that um, the interfaces changed in just enough, and I don't remember how we fixed it. Um, I want to say if you use like an E1000 compatible interface, this should work. But... If uh, um, you're having problems with this and you're, you're banging your head and you can't get it to work, again, ping me on Twitter or find me on IRC or, or find me on Slack. Uh, um, uh, just John Hawley. Um, it, there should be a Warthog 9 in my name on the OSS uh, ELC uh, Slack, um, and I'll see what I can do to, to give you a hand getting that up and running. Um, doo -doo -doo. Ooh, we've got new questions. Let me pop down here. Uh, does man include Ansible help? I want to say that the the manual page will have um, like the this uh, the, the command line switches and whatnot, but it's not going to give you the whole documentation. So you, you're way better off going and looking at docs.ansible.com um, to look for the 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 more interesting bits you can do. Um, but if you're having problems like running Ansible dash playbook or something like that, man, the man page will, will give you all of the command line switches to, to help you figure out what's going on there. Um, do, 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 do. Um, are there any Ansible books? Um, I have not gone looking for books because honestly, the docs page is so good. <laughs> I mean, it really is very rare um, for me to deploy something and have such good documentation available. Um, if you haven't done a lot of sysadmin or uh, DevOps or, you know, just old school systems work, having this much documentation that's this good is very rare. And I, my hat really does go off to the, the Ansible crew for having such good documentation. Um... My uh, uh, Twitter account is at Warty, W-A-R-T-Y, Whiskey, Alpha, Romeo, Tango, Yankee, 9. Um, that's my public side. If for whatever reason you forget that one, um, since I go by Warthog 9 everywhere else, I also have Warthog 9. I won't respond to you on that one because for legacy reasons, that one's um, a locked account and I'm not going to unlock it anytime soon. Um, but I, uh, but uh, you should be able to find me there. Um... Uh, let's see. 
Uh, yes, my SSH config module is out on GitHub. So if you go find my, my GitHub, it was the last update to it. Um, should have been this last week. Um, I think I finally cleaned up the Git tree and finally pu- uh, pushed it out. Um, it's based on some work that um, uh, an, uh, a developer at Red Hat originally did uh, to flip SSH ports around, and I just kind of extended it. It's not complete. It's got some issues if you're going to generally deploy it. I'm not opposed to fixing them. Um, particularly since I, I deal with uh, some fire, or specifically setting up firewall rules and SE Linux permissions for those new ports. And since I'm only using NF tables everywhere, I've only done things for NF tables, but I'm not opposed to getting like firewall D properly bolted in there and all that kind of stuff. Um, or, you know, if you want to give me patches, I, I, I will happily take patches. <laughs> uh, um, uh, what is the best way? Best way to organize big Ansible projects. So this gets really, uh, some of this is just going to get off into how you want to logically think about your own infrastructure. Um, The way I've been doing it um, for my own infrastructure is I actually clone the roles directly into uh, my own um, copy so that I can actually track what version of the the roles I'm using. So if you're, um, Galaxy, a lot of the time they'll tell you to to use the Galaxy install command. I'm actually just pulling those down directly into my own repository or into my own file tree into a roles directory. And then I reference them directly from there just for my own tracking purposes. After that, it's a lot of what you're going to end up finding is just how do you organize your own machines? How do you logically think about them? How do you group them? And, uh, you know, that's going to be very specific to everybody else's deployment. Um, and it's all going to depend on how many machines you've got um, and what you're doing. And j- just try, you know, think, you know, the only thing I can really recommend there is think about how you look at your own infrastructure and think about how you you want to parcel it out, how you want to break it up. You know, what are the common pieces? Um, and if you can write roles for that, you know, if you if you've got machines that are just um, uh, just web servers, you know, y- your entire playbook for your your group of machines that are just web servers may just be, you know, include this role, and then in your role you have all of the specific steps to 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 recreate, uh, um, you know, the web server piece. And that's not to, to say that you know maybe you've got some you know some very hyper converged kind of setups where you've got, you know, a web server and a virtual machine setup or something. If you kind of bundled these things together in in a way that you can include both of them as a role, then there's it, it, there's nothing really wrong with with including them and and kind of mixing and matching and and putting things together. It, to a certain extent, Ansible is going to be a, a bit like Lego pieces, um, where you can kind of put them together in different ways. And uh, you know, I, I would love to give you some really good recommendations on how to, you know, how do I handle deploying ten thousand machines from Ansible? I unfortunately do not have ten thousand machines <laughs> to 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 test this with. Test this with, yeah. Um, so I can't uh, give you too many good answers on that front, but I I, I can give you some generally good ideas and good practices. Just, you know, think about how you actually want things to, to be broken up and don't, and be prepared to, to re refactor things. Don't, you know, don't be scared to, to redo things when you realize that whatever process, you know, whatever breakup, whatever organization you've currently got doesn't quite work. Or, you know, you think of something better, you know, that, that you know, change is kind of inevitable. And the more you, you know, the more you recognize your own system and how it needs to grow, the more you're going to realize how, how this probably should all get put together. Um, uh, is Ansible overkill for setting up personal machines? No, <laughs> shockingly enough. Um, if you really like um, certain pieces of setup, uh, uh, sticking this all into an Ansible playbook and then just running it, like, you know, say you've got a new laptop and you really like, you know, how certain pieces of Bash are set up, how certain commands are, are, are you know, set up, how, you know, what's installed, those kinds of things. Um, all totally doable. In fact, I did a blog post on the VMware open source blog um, uh, where I actually, you know, took the, the it, it's now technically deprecated, but it still works fine. Um, VMware workstation module and actually showed you exactly how to um, get Ansible to install the whole thing and set it up for you, I- including the the um, uh, the serial number uh, um, for, for VMware workstation. So this is, so, it, you know, it's not overkill, um, but it, and it, and it can make, you know, like redeploying your system actually really straightforward for, um, 
you know, I just want my system back to the way I, I, you know, I like it. In fact, a lot of the, the things I'm using my, uh, uh, my Ansible setup for is, you know, on my servers or the virtual machines, just getting them to a level state where, you know, like, you know, Debian right now, if you have, um, Vim no X installed and you, you know, highlight something with a mouse, the mouse actually does something completely different than what it, or how it works on every other distro. And so I have specific rules for like, you know, how to undo that problem. Uh, um, uh, uh, just because I, I really hate the mouse being as, uh, active in Vim as, as, as it is in default in Debian. And so, you know, the, it's not overkill. So let's see. Yeah, there is a couple more, a couple of other questions a little bit further back that I glossed over. Um, someone asked all of the computers behind me. Let's see if I can find, there we go. Uh, that's just a screen. It's hooked up to a middle board. It's off, I think. Um, that's, that laptop is actually the machine I did most of the recording on. <laughs> Um, which is uh, uh, an old uh, ThinkPad. Um, there are actually a lot of ThinkPads on my desk. Um, and that's probably, and, you know, there's a printer behind my head. So anyway, um, I'm going to take one more quick glance at the questions and see if there's anything else that looks like it needs to be answered. Um, if not, and that's kind of the way it looks right now, um, thank you for all, uh, for all attending. Um, thank you for making it, it all the way through to the end. And if you have questions, obviously, um, track me down on Twitter, track me down on Slack um, during the conference. Um, I'm around. I, 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 I would rather answer your questions and help you, you know, get through even you know, getting this far um, so that you can start uh, taking a look at more things going forward. So again, thank you for coming and have a good day.